Let's role play with a capital R. Hey everyone, Jake here from Monsters and Munchkins, and today we are going to be talking about one of my favorite subjects, and that is role playing. What does it mean to really, really, really role play? Now, this can be done in a variety of ways. Spoilers up ahead for Red Dead Redemption 2. Now, I recently, just over the pandemic, had time to beat Red Dead Redemption 2 after having the ending spoiled for me, so if it's not been spoiled for you, don't watch this part of the video. In the game, Arthur Morgan is this main character. He's kind of a bandit, but he's been living by these laws which have been set down by his adoptive father figure. He's a criminal with a code of honor. Over the course of the game, the group progressively does worse and worse things as they're running from the law. Things get out of hand rather quickly. Over the course of the game, Arthur begins to realize that's not the person he wants to be, and his honor and dignity still mean something to him despite the situation that they're in. Towards the end of the game, he gets sick with tuberculosis and is it's basically a death sentence. So he begins to try to atone for the things that they've done in the group. Now, at the end of the game, you are having a shootout between the feds and the members of the group, the members of the bandits that have kind of formed this mini civil war amongst themselves. And at the end, you have a choice. Your best friend, John, is trying to get away and you have the choice to either go back for the money or to help him get away. Now, player Jake wanted to go back for the money because money's cool, but thinking about it from Arthur's perspective, I knew that he would want to help John at that point in time. He's gone through so much just to get to this point and to try to help his friends get out that this is where he took his stand. So that's what I did. And I got the nice ending where you get to die with your horse and you know, everything is sad and sappy, but it's what we wanted the whole time. That is an example of role playing. When you make a decision that your character or army or NPC in a video game would make. PC in a video game. I recently had a very cool and informative chat with my friend Alan from Panopticon Gaming, which you can find on the channel, where we talked about a number of topics, and this was one of them. I think when a lot of people get into RPGs, I know my friend group, when I kind of, you know, I played RPGs previously, kind of got out of it into the beginning of junior high school, people got back into it, most of them got into it just because they played Skyrim and thought it was cool, which is totally awesome. I mean, Skyrim's a great game, and if we can do something like that with our friends and dice, hey, it's even better, right? However, there's this initial kind of area when we're getting into role-playing where it's uncomfortable, I think, for a lot of people. People aren't okay with doing the things uh, that their character would actually do. Most people are certainly not okay with talking in character. That's completely alien and bizarre. So when we get into RPGs, a lot of the time is spent just saying how you want to kill monsters on a very surface level thing like I will now make an attack roll. I will now make an investigation check. I will now say this and they, it's always you know third person outside point of view and that's perfectly fine. That's kind of an outside introduction to the world of RPGs and if you come from a perspective where you've played a lot of MMORPGs and a lot of video games I feel like that is where we all start. However there is an evolution of this right there's a step up there's a step up in role playing where we begin to think like a character in a world that we can interact with. And this is something I try to press on my party, and if most people get to this stage, I am extraordinarily happy. They talk in character, even if it's without an accent. They begin to say, rather than, I will make an attack roll, which, ugh, that's awful. Don't say I, what type of roll. My, my least favorite thing is, what type of roll is this, Jake? What am I, what am I rolling here? When they've not described an action, because, well, your character hasn't done anything, so how can you be making a roll for something that you haven't done? So this next step in role playing is when you say what you are going to do, even if it's still in third person, is when you say, I will swing my sword at the stupid monster's head. I will point my finger, mutter the arcane words of a spell, and cast fire. Now that's a little bit more advanced than something I like to do when I play spellcasters, but saying an action that your character is taking. For instance, in the last session of Iceman Dale, one of the players said to me, what is the role to get out of my cell? But then one of the other players said, what's the action? And then he said, I would like to investigate the bars on the bottom of my cell and check how loose they are, how tight together they are. Is there anything on the floor of the cell? So that was an investigation check because Dan, bless his heart and how far he's come playing this game, is describing an action that his character is doing. And this is is a form of role playing that is absolutely beautiful and I think a relatively achievable goal for everybody because there's nothing uncomfortable about it, there's no silly voices, there's no strange decisions, it's just extraordinarily straightforward. Now we can take this a little bit further, going more in depth about what you're doing, going more in depth about the things you're doing in combat, describing the little mannerisms that your character has when they sit down. Do they wipe the area they're about to sit in? Do they have notes that they constantly check, supplies that they go over, things that they always say, mannerisms that make it feel like they're a real person. In combat, maybe they describe the components to the spell that they're using or the exact swing that they're making with their sword. I know when I play swashbuckling type characters, I do enjoy looking up fencing maneuvers and fencing terms, so I'm able to interject that into the roleplay. Also in this stage, this is where I think some people start 
start to experiment with the idea of silly voices. You don't need to voice act to play an RPG. That idea is completely, completely wrong. You can talk in your voice the entire time and still have fun playing an RPG, especially if you're not doing it for entertainment. But in this area of role playing, where we're trying to expand and get better at the role play, the silly voices do help, even if it just gives us, you know, this is when I'm talking in character. This is what my character is saying to you. We're not saying, well, Ren would like to say blah, blah, blah. You just say it. You just say what your character is saying. And I think a lot of people are shy or timid or not very willing when they're trying to do this type of RP because they're like, oh, maybe my voice will be bad. Maybe people will make fun of me. Maybe blah, 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 blah. But who, here's the thing, guys. Nobody cares. Use the freaking silly voice and have a good time doing it. And if you're having a good time doing it, I can guarantee everybody else at the table will be having a good time with your silly voice because you're having a good time with your silly voice. Even, even if it's the worst accent in the entire world, absolutely terrible, but you sell it, your friends are gonna like it. And guys, if you're playing with someone that's doing a bad accent, be nothing but encouraging because they're trying. And trying is the most important thing when we're talking about this stuff. When you're making an effort, the DM, first of all, is going to absolutely love you because you're making an effort. And the other players at the table will be supportive because you are making an effort. So this is this level of role-playing where now we're speaking with what our character is doing. We're describing their mannerisms. We're talking like the character. We're doing those things that make your character feel like a real person. But there's another level of real realism in role playing that I feel like people generally don't get to. There's this level of role playing a character where maybe you're not so much playing that character anymore as stepping into that character's shoes. You know that character's mannerisms like the back of your own hand. You know that character's thought process which are different from your own. And you know what that character does, what that character doesn't do, what that character likes, what that character dislikes. And over time, because you are stepping into this role of that character, your character will become a real person. They will change with their environment. They'll change with their friends. They'll change with the experience that they've had. And it takes on a breath of its own, a life of its own. Now we've all had those fun, goofy characters that you know are kind of one dimensional. Like my favorite that I've ever played is Krushk. Krushk had a big ox and Krushk would like to go hit things in the head and somebody took Krushk's wolves. He was very sad. So Krushk the half orc with his big ax wanted to get his wolves back. And you know what, that was a ton of fun, but Krushk was a relatively one dimensional character as opposed to my character Cassius, which I played in my brother's Curse of Shroud campaign. Now Cassius was complicated. Cassius was very sad over the course of the campaign. Cassius had had a rough life, but Cassius made some bad choices and he felt forever responsible for that. And over the course of the campaign, my role playing of Cassius was him trying to come back from that and right the wrongs that he had done. And you know, honestly, it was emotionally taxing to play Cassius, but I had a fantastic time doing it and I had a fantastic time growing with the character and I had a fantastic time seeing how he changed and seeing how his actions shaped him as a person. Now, here's the thing, guys. <laughs> More important than role-playing is having fun. So if you intentionally make a belligerent character who is giving your friends a hard time all the time, for very little reason and overall is a shallow character whose only character trait is I bother my friends with these imaginary problems that don't mean anything in fantasy land. Don't role play like that. Don't make the guy who's going to break the social contract of the RPG. Don't make the guy who is going to give your friends a hard time. Don't be that guy. Nobody likes that guy. And that guy, I can almost guarantee when he goes down in a fight, the rest of the party's probably gonna go like, well, he's dead. We're moving on, nobody cares. Some of the other things I talked about with Alan with is if you're going to be making a character and you're not super comfortable with role playing right off the bat, put a lot of yourself into that character. If you're role playing someone that's not too dissimilar from yourself, it's going to feel natural at first and that is a great way to get started. If you're a nerd, maybe make a wizard who likes books, who likes stories and fantasy comics in a fantasy land and is similar to yourself. If you like exercising, maybe make a fighter. You, you get the picture. Make things that you feel comfortable playing. Have similar personality types. If you're naturally a leader, make someone who's very charismatic. If you're naturally quieter, but you like looking for stuff and you like figuring things out, maybe make a character with a high wisdom. You know, those are just things that you can pick out about yourself and put into your character to make the process more rewarding, more fun, more natural. Let's just briefly touch on character death for a moment. The pinnacle of a good character is when your character dies and everybody else is sad. Now that might sound horrible. You put all this work into your character and now they're dead. And that is the worst feeling ever. However, if your character dies doing something that they would do, doing something with their friends, 
doing something that makes the world however they wanted to make the world and your party they don't have to cry they don't have to visually be upset but you can feel the mood in that moment just kind of drop that is the sign that you've made a character that's made an impact and i think that's really the goal of what we're trying to do so if your character dies or if your friend's character dies take the moment to appreciate that and take the moment to let that sink in because there's so much to explore there so much you know, humans spend their whole life in some portion of it at least being worried about their own morality so we have an outlet to explore it so if your character dies in an rpg take that time so to break down the things in this video Role-playing grows over time. There are stages of role-playing. Try to describe your actions. You don't need to talk in a funny voice, but if you can, hey, that's a good time for everybody. When you're fighting, describe your actions. I can guarantee it will make combat more fun. Don't be the guy that ruins the game for everybody else by making a pain in the ass character intentionally and knowing that nobody else will like him and saying, well, this is what my character would do. That's not role-playing. That's an excuse to be a jerk. Finally, if you are uncomfortable with any of this stuff, just try it with a supportive group. Put yourself into your character and let yourself grow from that more naturally occurring type of role play. And finally, in character death, explore the depth of it and see how that affects your party, yourself, and the overall tone of the campaign. Hope you guys have enjoyed this video. Let me know what you thought in the comments down below after you like and subscribe or dislike and subscribe so you can come back and tell me what you think I'm doing wrong. If you would like, you can follow the applicable links in the description down below. We stream Dungeons & Dragons on Twitch on Fridays from 6 to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and it is a good time where we do these things live for you on the air. Put out videos twice a week, and we have news coming out on our Facebook and our Instagram, all of which is down below, along with some homebrewed lists and some cool monsters that you can toss into your games. In the meantime, guys, you've been wonderful. Once again, I've been Jake from Monsters and Munchkins. Until I see you again, don't forget to have fun and roll some dice.